Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher, back from beautiful Hawaii and ready to get back at it now that I'm all relaxed and rested and a little sunburned, but that's okay. So what we're going to talk about today is AI in healthcare. And I've mentioned it a couple times before, but there's been some things that I know have worried people, things that have been coming up, not just in headline news, but also I've noticed that the APC, American Academy of Professional Coders, has um, some new tools and some webinars on this, even though they're hard to find on their site. So hopefully they're hearing me on that. But let's just take a look because I'm noticing that doctors are using AI in their documentation and it's not fully um, tested yet. Also, if you're using AI in a scribe, remember, you cannot time your visit with anything that scribe does because now that is part of administrative charting by somebody else. And remember, when you look at CPT 2024, page 13, it not only talks about for coding, but it says it's the total time and the date of the encounter that includes the face-to-face, yes, and non-face-to-face personally spent by the physician or QHP on the day of the encounter. That's the person that can bill out directly. And that's not your scribe. And it said it does not include time and activities normally performed by clinical staff. And scribes are not clinical staff. Even if they were, they would be exempt here. They are administrative staff. So you definitely can't use anything that they're doing as part of the time to chart your notes. Because remember, that is part of what you can use for time is, is charting. And if you're just giving prompt and let prompts and letting AI take take over, you've lost that time control from that scribe. So I've done a couple audits on this and a lot of doctors are saying, but I'm giving them the words. That's not enough. You have to be the one to do the complete work personally. And if you're not doing that, then you can't count that time there. There are shortcuts, of course, when it comes to um, AI and, and hopefully it's, it's for a greater good, you know, you're trying to get better outcomes. But what I'm seeing a lot of times is even though AI has the potential to make substantial progress toward the goal of making healthcare really more personalized, predictive, preventative, and interactive, you know, AI is, is still not a mature tool yet. So AI based systems have raised concerns regarding data security and privacy. And you know, last week, I just talked about some HIPAA breaches. And because health records are so important and vulnerable to hackers, they do often get targeted Uh, during data breaches. And right now we don't have standard guidelines for even the moral use of AI and ML, which is machine learning. And it it can, in healthcare, that has served to only kind of worsen the situation a little bit. Um, There's also debates on how far artificial intelligence may be utilized ethically in healthcare settings. Again, since there's no universal guidelines for its use. And I can't believe this current administration hasn't put those safeguards and guidelines on there. And so, you know, maintaining the confidentiality of medical records is crucial, but then that also kind of makes for some possible drawbacks of AI in the healthcare sector because they have to figure out and and learn from the data that they're collecting to make an algorithm uh, for that information. So you have to also explain to your patients, hey, I'm using AI if that's something that you are using um, to do any kind of note taking, to do any kind of thought processes. You know, AI is interesting because I know a lot of people don't think I'm a proponent of it, but I am. I mean, we have some new IT based technologies and they do cut costs, you know, remote patient monitoring. We have some things that uh, patients can wear like Holter monitors and, um, you know, devices that really help to, again, machine learning and they assist medical practitioners in clinical data management. Absolutely. You know, these um, applications, they think and learn and they're programmed by people, scientists, physicians, but, and it can help simplify healthcare systems. But remember, Medicare delivery systems that are artificially intelligent, but now are showing bias are, are not, you know, um, they're projecting that person who's, um, programming at their own personal bias, their own morality. This is where we're getting into 
some really interesting problems and issues. You know, even though artificial intent, uh, artificial intelligence, I'm sorry, has the potential to really make some substantial progress, you really have to understand that within that goal and hopefully them continuing, you know, to present path and ultimately become a mature and effective, effective tool for biology, you have to understand the, the essential applications of AI and what the obstacles that they are dealing with right now, implementing any information technology uh, for healthcare and how they're getting some of their information and making sure that information is not um, plagiarized or is not coming from sources that are not accurate. And we have found that as well, especially in a lot of healthcare business and complexity models. Uh, when we look at accessibility or if data is not readily available and so the algorithm is using old information but it is up to your providers to make sure that they are checking their work checking the resources checking the algorithms you know checking everything because they're going to be basically responsible for anything that is submitted anything that is um, written up narratively what's in the pa patient's medical record and if you really have a lot of information without a lot of safeguards and without a lot of development of this information, then you're, you're looking at some definite concerns and consequences of possible bias uh, information. So there's been some potentially distorted outcomes for the, from these biases and the col data collection processes used in some model um, developments for AI. For instance, um, I was just reading in World of News Report, it said under representation of minorities as a, con a consequence of possible racial bias in data set development, um, many, many methods exist for combating this bias but then also and this is going to be a very touchy subject and i apologize if this offends anybody i'm not trying to i'm just giving you some some science talk here when we get into some of this information with the transgender community remember even though you're free to do what you like to do that's why we live in this country when you represent yourself as not the the biological gender that you are and there needs to be uh, services for specifically a woman's body specifically a man's body remember your dna doesn't change just because you're changing your external um, and chemically changing your certain things about yourself to change your appearance of your gender it, it, this sometimes I'm noticing that these algorithms and this information is incorrectly collecting data on the incorrect ja uh, gender. Think about that for you know um, cervical cancer and breast cancer when the algorithm is and again is only as good as what it's what's being put in there and what it's programmed for is actually discussing someone who is a biological male even if they transitioned and they call themselves a trans female but it, it's not female information as traditionally what we need for female bodies so again i'm not making a political statement i'm just trying to explain that ai tends to have things and especially right now they call it a black bo box problem and it's the lack of the ability to provide convincing applications for some of the things that they're forecasting. And if these recommendations for certain patients are wrong, the system has no way to defend itself legally. It also makes it harder for scientists to understand how the data connects to their predictions. And it could also cause people to lose faith in, medical, in the medical system altogether. So there's so many things that are tied into what we're seeing with AI right now. And, you know, so a lot of it is for commonly prescribed medications and how it's understood and just the basic understanding of certain things. It's, it's really important to make sure that you have not just a good program, but you have something that shows where it's resourced from, where they're getting information from, um, who's accountable for the information, where the data privacy and security issues are being compliant because the consequences aren't just about HIPAA. I talked about that last week. The consequences are now about treating patients incorrectly if you have um, bad information or information from the algorithm that is faulty based on just how it was 
programmed and how the applications uh, were were attempted to enhance maybe some medical I- outcomes, but there was an error. And so, you know, who's going to be to blame for that if there's no safeguards? The FDA, HHS, they're the ones that have to, you know, really look at a lot of this innovation and make sure that they're not just completely accepting of everything. And so same with the uh, NIH. So, you know, the national, also the National Library of Medicine and the National Center for Biotechnology Information, they are all over this. And it's just, it's just so important before you take on any AI um, capabilities, please, please, please make sure you know uh, what you, what company you're using, what the safeguards are, if there's any bias, and they have to disclose that to you because then your physician will have to disclose that to the patient if they use it. So it's just something that I wanted to alert you to because there was also a uh, article in the October issue of the AAPC magazine, and it was interesting because I was reading some of it, and it was actually not an article that it, I think it was four pages, and by page two I was bored. But the the article was talking about you know a case a case against coding nativity in AI scribes, and I thought, okay, well, scribes basically are just supposed to be you know recorders, basically a, a you know a tape recorder for a physician. So then when you add any other components of that where they have either clinical or they have knowledge or they have, uh, and terminology is fine, but but saying they've got clinical or they've got coding knowledge, now you get into some challenges of maybe someone, you know, AI scribes adding coding aware, coding information that may not be appropriate, but it also can maybe hurt uh, some of the um, let's say CDI professionals, clinical documentation integrity professionals trying to figure out if this is actually what the physician said or if this is accurate to be able to choose a level of service. I know a lot of times when we're looking at AI at a basic level, um, guidelines around coding and documentation can be very complex. And for example, I've noticed some errors, for instance, in the transition from the CMS HCC risk adjustment model. We had an update from version 24 to 28, effective January 1st, 2024. And that posed a serious challenges to organizations with meaningful use exposure to the Medicare Advantage program. And I noticed that some of those um, changes in that transition didn't extend to any scribes or any AI services they use. So, you know, healthcare is ever evolving. And as you know, and there's always constant change. And that's why we get code books every year. That's why we see articles out there. That's why I, I podcast. That's why I do webinars and education. And, and quite honestly, that's why I'm also such an advocate with CMS and making sure that I have update information, why I do webinars on a quarterly basis for Medicare and CMS. I want you to be informed. And sometimes the information is quicker than the updates. And so what we get as far as uh, information that's now out or update or you know new, then we look at the published guidance and sure enough, it's not there. So it's really important to make sure that you just have all this information, you, you are really safeguarding your team and not looking at down the line where there could be a big problem. The CodeCast podcast is also brought to you today by Part B News. Each week, Part B News delivers Medicare Part B regulatory coverage, plain English interpretive guidance, fee schedule updates, compliance hotspots, CEU opportunities, and best practices for submitting claims, coding, and more. Collect every dollar your practice deserves. Save $100 on a new subscription using coupon code PBN100. Visit codebooks.com to subscribe. I subscribe. It's a great publication and you know, I would, I, I have to have it. So hopefully you subscribe as well. So as a personal tidbit, my Steelers are doing a great job this season so far. And so I don't know who your football team is or if you have one, but hopefully yours is doing well as, as, as well as mine is. But uh, everyone have a great rest of your week. Make it a great day. And thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, Follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma. Music producer Assassin Music. <laughs>